sure, I can set up your sound system for you. But what do all those knobs do? So you know how to set up a sound system because you watched my other video on how to set up a sound system. But how do you hook up all those little things on the mixer? Today, I'm gonna walk you through how to set up an analog mixer. Whether you're used to digital or analog's all you got, this tutorial's for you. Now, you probably already know this, but it's worth going over again. You plug your microphone with a mic cable into the back side of the console. From the console's master output, you plug that into a powered speaker or a power amp that's going to a speaker. So I'm gonna plug this into channel 16. So if you watch my video on how to set your mic pre, which I'll put down in the description below, you'll know how to do this already, but follow along anyway. Hit PFL and turn up the gain while you're talking into the input. Check one, two, check one, two. Hey, hey, check one, two. Now you can turn up the master and turn up the fader. And don't forget to turn it on because some consoles have on instead of mute. That's how it goes. And now you should be able to hear the output from this mic to the speakers. Check one, two, hey, hey, check one, two. Sounds like success to me. Running sound is actually pretty basic. All we're doing is turning things up and turning them down. The mic pre is the first place where we turn it up. This is where we adjust the level coming into the console so that it's all even coming in. It takes it from mic level to line level. If your mic pre isn't set right, a lot of other things can go wrong. So be sure to watch that video. If the signal coming into your mic pre is too hot already, you've got it turned down all the way, but it's still too much level, then you can use the pad. This turns down the input by 20 dB, so now you have more fine control over where you can set your level. One more thing that could really trip you up is phantom power. Some mics are condenser microphones, and they require phantom power in order to operate. So if you plug in a mic and you turn it up and it's noisy and the signal's weak, check for phantom power. On this console, phantom power is global, so it'll go to every mic input if you turn it on. Now, Phantom power is okay to send to mics that don't need it unless it's a vintage ribbon mic. But if you're using a vintage ribbon mic with a console like this, we need to talk about your budget priorities. The next thing we have is the high pass filter. This cuts all the frequencies starting at that frequency that it has listed. If it's variable, awesome. Go ahead and watch my videos for how to EQ different channels for an idea of where to set it. Next comes the equalizer section. This lets us turn up and down different frequency ranges independent of the other frequency ranges. On this mixer, the high and low frequency bands are fixed point shelves. That means for the high shelf, the center frequency on the boost is 12K and it's gonna boost everything above 12K by that same amount. On the bottom band, it's set to 60 Hertz. So whatever gain adjustment you make at 60 Hertz, it's gonna do it for 60 Hertz and all points below as well. The center bands are bell curves and semi-parametric. What that means is that you can choose the frequency and adjust the gain up and down. Some less expensive mixers just have a fixed frequency for the mid bands as well. And so sometimes you just got to work with what you got. For more information on EQ, check out this link over here. Now, one part of the console that's not immediately noticeable just by looking at the front is the insert. An insert lets you patch in a piece of equipment into the channel path. So no matter where the channel goes after the insert, it's got that processing already on it. Most of the time, we use inserts for dynamic processors like compressors and gates. The insert jack lets you send and return off of one connector and one jack in the back of the console. On one end, we have a TRS connector that has two cables coming out of it. One cable is attached to the tip and the other is attached to the ring. On the other end, we have two TS cables, and they're labeled tip and ring. The thing you need to remember is that the tip is the send, and the ring is the return. The way I remember it is the R's go together. Ring, return. So as you patch in your compressor or gate or outboard EQ or whatever else you're going to put in the channel path, the tip goes into the input, and the ring goes into the output. Now you have to be careful when something's plugged into the insert jack, because if that's not patched in right and there's no signal coming back in on that ring, nothing else in the channel path is gonna get any signal, no matter how much you have your preamp turned up or how much you have your fader turned up. All right, let's hook up a compressor. I'm gonna take one end of my insert cable. I've got a few channels here. I'm gonna pick blue and green. Plug this into the insert jack on channel 16. On the other end, I'm gonna find blue and green and find which one says tip which one says ring? So you can see here, blue says tip and green says ring. So we're gonna plug that into the compressor's input for the tip and the output for the ring. We turn this over. You can't see it because it's blocked, but it says input here. It says outputs over here. So my ring is going to be on return and my tip into the input. There we go. Now, if we turn this over, and don't bend the connectors on the table, 
and take my microphone, check one, two, hey, check, check one, two. We can see we have input level on the compressor's input. We can tell we've got this hooked up right because A, there's signal coming back into the channel, which is a good thing, and B, we can actually hear it when we turn the knobs on the compressor. So that's how we know it works. Now the next section as we go down the console are the auxiliary sends. We'll talk about these more in a second because it's gonna be a lot easier to understand after we talk about the fader. Now this might be really elementary for you, but when you pull the fader down, it gets quieter, and when you push it up, it gets louder. The pan knob lets you choose whether you're sending it to the left channel or the right channel or any balance in between. Most of the time, you'll probably leave things in the center. Now, one other thing that trips some people up are bus assignment buttons. This console doesn't have it, but if you look for an ST or a 1-2, that'll let you assign your channel fader to a bus fader. This one's automatically connected to the stereo bus, but I have seen that trip people up, so look out for that if you get in a pinch. After the channel leaves the fader, it goes to the master fader, or the stereo bus, or the master bus. There's a lot of different names for this. This is the final level control before it goes out to your speakers. If you've got it turned down all the way, you won't get any level to your speakers. So don't do that. Now, just like there's an insert on the input channel, there's also an insert on the stereo bus. This allows you to insert a graphic EQ so that you can match the tone of the speakers to the tone of the room. Right above the channel fader, you'll find mute or on. And why they do this and why they're opposite confuses the heck out of me. There are some times when you don't want anybody hearing what's coming through that channel, and that's when the mute button is your friend. The mute button cuts the signal from going both to the stereo bus and to any aux sends it's sent to. This is helpful for when you just don't want to hear an input, or someone's unplugging something and you don't want it to pop through the system. And now we have Confusion Corner with James. Some consoles have mute, other consoles have on. With mute, lit up means it won't work. With on, lit up means it will work. Why do they do this? I do not know. Now that we've talked about channel faders in the main mix, now we can circle back around and talk about auxiliary sends. Auxiliary sends are just like the main mix, except they're going someplace else, and instead of a linear fader, you have a rotary knob. Most of the time, we use these for monitor mixes and sending out to an effects unit like reverb or delay. Now, just like our main mix has a master fader, our aux send also has a master knob. But one major point about aux sends is that they can be sent either pre or post fader. Pre fader means whatever level we set on that knob, that's what's gonna be going to the aux master. Post fader aux sends are affected by the level of the channel fader. If we set our channel fader at zero, that's going to send it to the aux send at the same level as if it were pre fader. But when it's post fader and we pull back that level by 10 dB, the level going to the aux send goes down by 10 dB as well. It's going to follow and track all the changes that you make on that channel fader. So how do you choose whether or not to use pre or post fader? Most of the time we use pre fader for a musician's monitor send. This way, any changes that we make to the main mix aren't going to affect the balance of the their monitor mix. Effects sends work better when they're post fader, because when we're sending to an effects unit and then returning it back into the console, we want the level relationship between the dry signal on the channel fader and the wet signal coming back into the console to be the same. This way, if you push a singer up in the mix, they're going to get the same amount of reverb increase on their vocal. Then when you pull them down, the reverb's going to go down as well. That way they don't feel further away just because you've turned their mic level down. So now let me hook up a reverb to an aux send that's switchable between pre and post fader. So then you can hear the difference of what it's like between pre fader and post fader. So you don't have to use stereo sends, but for this reverb unit, I'm gonna try because I was having trouble with one of the channels earlier. So we'll see if that works. Aux three and four on this board are switchable. So I'm gonna use both of those and see if we can get reverb to and from the unit. Let's take black and blue, plug them into three and four. Now on the other end here, we will take black and blue, plug them into the inputs. Now, returning, let's do gray and red. So, I like to do right on red all the time. That just helps me. So now we got that hooked up, inputs and outputs. On the other end here, we will take gray and red. Now you could plug in your reverb into a stereo return, but if you have the channels, I really like having my effects on a fader. So I'm gonna plug them into the line input of two channels. All right, so let's test this. Here we can hear it dry, although it is picking up the speaker beside me a little bit. And now if I've got aux three and four turned up and I've got the send turned up, well, you can see on here, you can see the input lights lighting up on the reverb unit input. Now let's turn up these faders and see if we can hear it. There's some noise. Whoa, here we go. Hey, we have reverb. All right, it's a little bit much. 
What a dial back a little bit. Check one, two, reverb check. Yeah! So if I turn down the channel fader, both the level of the channel goes away and the level of the reverb goes down. So now you can hear no reverb because we've turned down the channel fader. It's also brought down the level being sent to the reverb. Now if I switch it to pre-fader, we're gonna get reverb all by itself. So now you can see why it's better to send your effects post fader. And hey, if you like this video, hit thumbs up, share it with a friend, and be sure to subscribe and ding the little bell. Turn on all notifications so that you don't miss another video on making worship sound great at your church, or outreach, or youth camp, or barbecue. Check out more tutorials here, and we'll see you back here next time.